Hi, this is Dr. Kat Fleece from Central New Mexico Community College. In this video S, we're going to focus on the transport of carbon dioxide gases in our blood. Unlike oxygen, which is not very soluble in a liquid, carbon dioxide is much, much more soluble. And therefore, we see in our plasma that about 7 to 10 percent of the carbon dioxide is dissolved. Now, that's still not a whole lot. What we find is that 20 percent of our, of our carbon mon uh, dioxide is actually bound to hemoglobin to form something called carbamino hemoglobin. So a substantial amount of our carbon dioxide binds to one of the amines amino acids in our hemoglobin molecules. So it does not compete with the spot for oxygen, which is, of course, on the heme group. Carbon dioxide binds to an amino acid. The majority of our carbon dioxide, however, is going to be converted into these ions, which we refer to as bicarbonate ions, or HCO3 minus and they can hang out in the plasma very easily. The way they're formed is by means of the reaction you see below. This is a reaction you should memorize and not forget. You will need to know this reaction all the way into pathophysiology and probably beyond. Pharmacology, etc., etc. So this is what it says. When carbon dioxide can mix with water, which it can do in our blood plasma, for instance, it creates a very unstable compound called carbonic acid. This carbonic acid can then fall apart into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions. Notice that the arrows are, have, double, have heads on each end double-headed arrows, implying that this reaction can go, can be pushed to the right, or the reaction can be pushed to the left. And you might wonder why that needs to happen. Well, notice these hydrogen ions. Sometimes we need to fix the pH levels of our blood. And so we can increase or decrease the pH of our blood by changing the numbers of hydrogen ions. So if we need to decrease the pH of the blood because for some reason it increased, we can allow for this reaction to push to the right. On the other hand, we can get rid of the hydrogen ions by making it move to the left. And we're going to learn now how we can make this, these reactions shift around like that. Let's continue focusing on this reaction. Again, I'm showing it near the bottom of your screen here. First of all, when gas exchange occurs between our alveoli and our blood or between the tissues and our blood, we find that the carbon dioxide is going to very quickly diffuse from the plasma into our red blood cells. In the red blood cells, or in the red blood cells, then this reaction can occur as well. But it occurs much faster, but because the conversion of carbon dioxide and water into our unstable carbonic acid molecule is going to be catalyzed by an enzyme we find inside of our red blood cells called carbonic anhydrase. This is an enzyme we only find in our red blood cells and not in the plasma. We may find it, by the way, in some other cells as well, as we'll see later. But since we're now focusing on our blood, um, our plasma does not have this enzyme. So the conversion to, into carbonic acid occurs much faster inside of our red blood cells. By the way, 
Since most of our carbon dioxide diffuses almost immediately from the plasma into our red blood cells to then participate in this reaction pre prevents the pH from changing too much in our blood. So inside of our red blood cells, the carbonic anhydrase enzyme can very quickly convert carbon dioxide and water into carbonic acid, which can then dissociate into its individual hydrogen ions and our bicarbonate ions. These hydrogen ions could bind to our hemoglobin molecules, which then is going to create our deoxyhemoglobin, as in oxygen will unload via the Bohr effect. Now, why is this reaction so important in our body? Well, it functions as a buffer. It functions as what we refer to as the alkaline reserve. Various areas in our body depend on this alkaline reserve created by the carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer. Let's take a look. Suppose the pH of our blood is starting to drop, meaning we're accumulating more and more hydrogen ions in our blood. Well, if we have more product, that is going to push our reaction to the left, to where we now allow for the hydrogen ions to combine with the bicarbonate ions to recreate our gar carbonic acid. So we're pushing the reaction to the left as we are accumulating more and more hydrogen ions. And as we do this, we're now getting rid of the hydrogen ions and therefore we return our pH back to normal. The opposite can be the case as well. Let's say that our product, namely our hydrogen ion levels, are dropping. That will pull the reaction to the right so that we are going to continue to dissociate carbonic acids into our hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions, and our pH goes back to normal. Now, one way we can really make this reaction move either to the right or to the, to the left, I should say, is by, uh, by us blowing off more and more carbon dioxide, by us breathing out more and more carbon dioxide. If we remove carbon dioxide, if we remove our reactants, that's going to pull our reaction to the left. And this is a way for us to remove some of these hydrogen ions and restore pH in the blood. So for instance, let's say that we've been working out really hard and we've built up all of this lactic acid in our muscles, our skeletal muscles, we can increase our respiratory rate to therefore exhale all of that carbon dioxide faster, we say blowing off carbon dioxide, and that's going to pull our reaction to the left such that we get rid of our hydrogen ions that are pulling down the pH due to the buildup of lactic acid. So we can change our respiratory rate to fix our blood pH. Let's take a look now at this reaction inside of our red blood cells, even in our blood plasma. Let's take a look at this diagram, which shows the gas exchange occurring between our tissue cells and our blood. So this would be internal respiration. Notice the direction of the carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide has been accumulating in the tissues, and it's now moving into our blood. On the other hand, oxygen is going to be unloading and is going to be delivered to our tissues. Let's actually start real quickly with oxygen, despite the fact that we've studied uh, oxygen transport already. Remember, there's a very small amount of oxygen dissolved in our blood plasma, and so it is going to follow its pressure gradient into the tissues. At the same time, we're going to see that oxygen unloading occurs from hemoglobin and that oxygen will then leave our red blood cell, enter the tissues again following its partial pressure gradient, which leaves us with deoxyhemoglobin 
And let's remember this deoxyhemoglobin, which is going to eventually have to bind a hydrogen ion uh, to form our HHB. So how do we get that hydrogen ion? Well, that relates to carbon dioxide. So first off, a relatively small amount of carbon dioxide, 7 to 10 percent or so, will dissolve in the blood plasma, which is much more than how much oxygen can dissolve. Um, another Another 20% or so will diffuse readily into our red blood cells where it will bind with hemoglobin to form carbaminohemoglobin, or HbCO2. When this occurs, it's going to promote oxygen unloading. So when carbon dioxide binds to hemoglobin, it actually promotes the Bohr effect or oxygen unloading. Now, carbon dioxide can also enter into the reaction we just studied, both in the plasma as well as inside of the red blood cells. So the carbon dioxide that participates in this reaction inside of our plasma is going to become bicarbonate ion, is going to be converted into bicarbonate ions and hydrogen ions. But this all occurs relatively slowly because we do not have that carbonic and hydrase enzyme in the plasma to catalyze the reaction of carbon dioxide and water into carbonic acid. But it happens, but slowly. These hydrogen ions that result from this reaction will try to bind with plasma proteins in an attempt to not disturb the pH of the blood too much. Clearly, if hydrogen ions start to build up to where we don't have enough plasma proteins, that will start affecting our pH levels of our blood. Most of our carbon dioxide will quickly diffuse into our blood. We already mentioned it can become um, part of hemoglobin, but the majority of our carbon dioxide that enters into our red blood cells, again, takes part in our famous reaction. This time it occurs really fast because we do have carbonic anhydrase, and we again form our car bicarbonate ions and our hydrogen ions, and these are the hydrogen ions that will then um, get buffered by binding to hemoglobin. Now, there's another interesting thing that happens. This, these bicarbonate ions that begin to accumulate in our red blood cells due to this reaction are going to readily diffuse out of our red blood cells. And instead, another negative ion diffuses back in, and that is chloride. We refer to this as the chloride shift. So why does this happen? Well, by these bicarbonate ions moving into our plasma, they can help buffer our plasma. In other words, if hydrogen ions start to accumulate in our plasma due to tissues being metabolically active, these hydrogen ions that can't find plasma proteins to bind with could potentially bind to bicarbonate ions and push the reaction to the left to where we eventually produce more carbon dioxide, which can then be blown off. This process where bicarbonate ions trade places with chloride ions in between the red blood cells and the plasma, we refer to as the chloride shift. And we see this happening by means of facilitated diffusion. This happens in other places, this being this, this chloride shift. So we're going to see this happening in the opposite direction in our lungs, for one but we're going to see it happening in other organ systems as well. So keep this in mind. We're going to see that almost always this reaction, 
where carbon dioxide and water form by uh, carbonic acid, which then forms bicarbonate ions and hydrogen ions, the bicarbonate ions will typically trade places with chloride ions. And so, as I just mentioned, in the lungs, we're going to see that the bicarbonate ions are going to diffuse into our red blood cells while the chloride ions will leave. So we see the opposite um, exchange of these ions. And of course, the direction of all of the arrows for oxygen and carbon dioxide are going to be in the opposite direction as well. Clearly, this time over here, we're looking at our alveolus, while over here, we're looking at the capillary visiting the alveolus. So let's come back for a moment to carbon dioxide also binding with hemoglobin in addition to dissolving in the plasma and in addition to forming bicarbonate ions. Now, when carbon dioxide binds to hemoglobin to form carbaminohemoglobin, it's going to promote the unloading of oxygen. So, as we load hemoglobin with carbon dioxide, it's going to promote unloading of oxygen. And the reverse is true as well. If we load hemoglobin with oxygen, which is referred to as our Bohr effect, we tend to see unloading of carbon dioxide. And by the way, that we refer to as the Haldane effect. So the Haldane effect always refers to carbon dioxide, while the Bohr effect always refers to oxygen. And so this wraps up our discussion of the transport of carbon dioxide.